meet a native Palmetto State recording artist who now calls the Tar Heel State home. You'll meet him coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at the Fox 43 studio in Myrtle Beach. We're visiting with somebody who's been recognized as one of the most durable musicians in the world, Maurice Williams. Good morning, Good Maurice. Morning. Good morning, Greg. Thanks so much for being with us today and tomorrow. Your willingness to come back tomorrow to be in here is uh, truly a treat. I, I know this is a big trip down from Charlotte and the commitment to get you back in. It was almost a year ago when we were visiting at the Bell South Building in Florence. Mm-hmm. Yes, which I was. Which was wonderful. That was in preparation for a concert you had, I guess, on either New Year's Eve or right before that down in Charleston. Yes, there was a show in Charleston. Which was very special. Yes, it was beautiful. How, was yes, that pretty well attended? Yes. Oh, it was packed. It's running over. I guess it's probably tough for you to perform anywhere that's not packed and uh, running over. Usually it's, it's like that. It's, it's usually packed. We've been blessed with that, which is, mm-hmm. which is really good, and we're so thankful for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. mm-hmm. And then I guess it was back around uh, maybe February when we were together at Bradley House Studios in Florence preparing for, maybe it was April, preparing for the Long Bay Symphonies event, uh, the Beach Music Legends. Yes. Yes, which was, was another packed crowd. I think the only time the Long Bay Symphony has had a, that kind of a turnout was with you and Billy Scott and uh, Bill Pinckney. It was beautiful. That was an amazing performance. That was. It, it, was, it was something for us. And uh, I think they had standing room only. They did. There, as I recall. I think our... Uh, our director showed up and sat uh, sat in the uh, in the aisles, literally, because <laughs> really? it was so packed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to really see when you're on stage performing with the lights of you know dead eyes, but from what I could see, I saw a few people standing up out there. So oh I yeah. Think, this is good. You know, because I, I, I very seldom look at, look out because we're concentrating on what we're doing. Right. But that night was just special. You could see because people were standing around. I oh, said, yeah. oh, baby, this is good. It was a packed <laughs> house. It was wonderful. That was amazing. What's that like, Maurice, Being uh, knowing you can't meet eyes with everyone in the crowd, but knowing all those folks are just totally fixated on you, uh, it, I, I'm sure at some level, is that difficult to perform, knowing you can't be face-to-face with it? I mean, what, what's that like for someone who's a non-performer? Well, it would be scary if you think about it, but uh, I learned to just look straight ahead and, and uh, perform, concentrate on performance, you know, and then after a while it becomes just natural, it, but you never, I never concentrate on the audience, not just too totally concentrate, unless they're sitting right in front of me, I may go up and talk. Right, that, right. That really takes a lot of attention off, if if that's possible. Mm-hmm. But uh, for an audience like that, we I used to just look straight straight ahead and, and perform. And then uh, usually, I know if I'm in an audience and somebody's looking straight ahead and performing, you may think they're looking directly at you. Right. When they are not. Like the Mona really, Lisa. Yeah. Yes, right. that type of situation. Mm-hmm. And 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 in an audience like we had. When the lighting is so beautiful and directly on you, you can't really see the audience anyway, which is really good. Mm-hmm. I was, I was, we were trained that way at an early age at the Apollo Theater. Mm-hmm. When we perform each day the same way, and we could never see the audience because the lights were so bright on us. Right. And uh, once we learned that, we. The first, one of the first things we learned was you never worry about who's in the audience. You perform. You, you do your performance. Mm-hmm. And that way, it doesn't, you, you're not worried, is that ten people? Right. Is it one person? If it's one person, I ain't going to sing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you, you, you learn, you, you perform anyway, whether right. the house is packed or whether it's two or three people. Sure. And that way, you are really on the one. Is there an, we learned at the Apollo Theater. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was at the Apollo Theater. Yes. At early age. It was back in 60. You're 60, kidding. Yes, six, late 60. You had access to the Apollo Theater in the in the 60s. Yes. You, you pretty young guy then. That's uh, 
Yeah, I was. That's a big deal. When you think about that aspect, and I guess when you're performing for an audience, you have to assume everyone's like the President of the United States. I mean, you're making that big effort for as if everyone's the same. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. That is exactly right. And this is the way we were trained at that age. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with it like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes, it, like club dates, it may be kind of hard to do because I remember once, uh, it was, this was like in maybe early 70s, we played a club down in uh, Alabama where we had three people for a whole week. Three for a whole week? The same three. No way. The same three people. I don't think it was advertised. I, I don't recall what, what the deal was. Right. But we had three people for a whole week. The same three people would come in. And that was hard to do. That was really hard to do. But we made it with the strength of thinking back to the Apollo days. We had to have a meeting every night to go out there and perform. Mm -hmm. You know, and our manager, Harry Goins, at the time, he told us, hey, remember the Apollo day? Mm -hmm. You know. These, these same three people would pay their money to come and see you guys, so you got to do it. So we went and did it, gave it our best. Now, that was hard, but we did it. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm sure for you, I mean, you know, you never know who you're going to be performing in front of. You don't you know, know if that gal, man or woman could be the cousin of an amazing record producer that or have it. some tie. Even if you make that effort to get out in the crowd after performance and find some of those things out, you may never find out. They may bump into somebody next month uh, or marry us. Uh, so, I mean, you know, who knows? So that's, you just never know. That's exactly right. So we got through that one, and we, we did exactly what we were taught to do. We just went out there and performed, man, you know. And uh, it went over, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because the manager, he didn't have any squabbles. We talked. My, ma my manager says that. Well, they probably didn't advertise this thing. So, but that's not our responsibility to worry about advertisement. Our responsibility is to perform, and that's exactly what we did. Great. Amazing we pulled that thing off, man. I said, wow. That must have been. <laughs> I thought it was looking, you know, just looking back now on it. That was something. Gosh. That must be. Just to, and to know you made that effort and did it right. You did yes. it right. You performed as if it was their first and last, the last time they'd see you and uh, really made it special. That's wonderful. Yes, and we made, we had three fans forever. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> At you least know, you knew you had three more albums that will be sold the next year. and Continuously. That's great. Beautiful. Golly, Maurice. You are a native of the Palmetto State, but now live yes. in the Tar Heel State. Yes. But right on, you're very close to the border, so you, you've probably got your uh, hand in both states still to a great degree. Definitely. Definitely. Share with the viewers where you grew up, Maurice. Oh, Lancaster. Lancaster, South Carolina. What, what was it like uh, growing up in Lancaster? It was it was wonderful, typical teenager, you know. Mm -hmm. It was good. It was really good. We were in high school, and uh, I thought it was great, you know, to to me because we were in a, a thing where we did. It was almost like uh, the show, the TV show. With the, with the guys when they would go to the soda shop. What's the name of that show? Happy Days. Happy Days. Yeah. It was looking at Happy Days and I said, that's just the way we grew up. Because mm -hmm. we would do the same thing. We'd go to the soda shop, we'd drive cars, get in trouble. <laughs> it was typical, you know, we get in a lot of trouble, but we, <laughs> we, we were typical teenagers. After, the, after school, we would go to the soda shop on the corner. And um, uh, we'd be there dancing. And putting money in the nickels in the jukebox. Right. Did all that. We lived it. You know, and wow. looking back, I said, this is amazing. I wish I could have wrote that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Golly, that was, it was amazing. We did, we did that. So Lancaster was, was beautiful growing up in Lancaster. What? We did. And some of the musicians that you followed growing up, who were some of your inspirations in the musical world? Well, first off, was Fats Domino. Fats Domino. Man. When we heard Fats, I said, gosh, I want to be just like that. Because uh, the way he just played the piano man and mm -hmm. sang, and uh, as Fats as Domino, we just, oh, it was crazy about Fats. Mm -hmm. Still mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Still is. Did yeah. you have a favorite song? From Fats? Well, one would be uh, Blueberry Hill. Blueberry Hill. And then uh, Blue Monday. Right. Yeah, I think Blue Monday is my favorite. 
of, of all, all the things that he did. He did so many beautiful songs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. man. And I love the, all, all this stuff. I'm a big fan of Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? What do you think inspired you at an early age to get uh, to become uh, to get into music? Did you have were you from a musical family? Uh, yes, my sister Carol, uh, she uh, played piano, and of course, of course, my mother played piano also. Mm -hmm. And um, my uncle Coy, he used to rehearse his band. Mm -hmm. He had a jazz band, and he, he rehearsed his band in our house. Mm -hmm. Because we had we had the piano and everything, mm -hmm. and so I was like knee high to his knee, knee high to his knee. Yes, I'm like yeah, knee high to his knee, <laughs> pulling on him when he would be playing the piano. So then I, I said, oh gosh, I gotta do that. And he said, get away, guys, I'm doing busy, busy, busy. <laughs> so after rehearsal, I go in and be bamming on the piano, and, bamming, and I just kept it up, and. and my mother and my sister Carol, I say, go ahead and play, you play. And then my aunt Inez, who's res responsible, really encouraging me to stay in music, to mm -hmm. really get into it. She started mm -hmm. taking me around. And I started playing, man, at, um, it was a Mason Hall, mm -hmm. right up the street from the house, in walking distance. Mm -hmm. So we, I would play there, the piano, when I learned, for the full dance, you know, for the whole dance. And I learned to do the bass. I was playing the bass with the, my left hand, and then uh, I was playing the boogie wiggle all the time. But I, I played fast, I played slow, I played in between, you know. And they danced, man, you know. Oh, and I yeah. Said, wow, okay. And she started teaching me about different things, and then mo mostly encouraging me to stay in the business. And Anna Inez, she was a performer as well? No, no. She just was the real encouragement. <sighs> Yeah, she she was an encouragement. Uh, mm -hmm. Her husband Coy, mm -hmm. Uncle Coy, mm -hmm. he 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 was a performer, and uh, he would take us around. Also, this is a little late. I'm jumping still. Right, right. no, no, <laughs> he that's fine. He would take us around, and um, she she was, I guess she was a socialite, mm -hmm. and uh, she started teaching me how to to speak, how to notice everything, how to be really in, on top of it. And I started <laughs> remembering I would, I would start imitating people. And then I was imitating performers, and I was doing Nat King Cole, and I was doing Vance Domino, and the whole thing. I was, I was, you know, I was overcome by these guys, so I, I wanted to be like them, so I started doing that stuff just right. like they would do it, right. you know. And hey, man. It started paying off. How amazing, Maurice. When you think I about had, you know, yeah. not, not no, I, had, I had one problem. <clears throat> I didn't know how to be original. You didn't know how to be original? I didn't know how to well, be you original. you learned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm talking about this early age. I just copied everybody. Right. right. I just copied, you know. And this is, I was a little guy, but I learned. But now, folk, folks are watching you. They, I mean, they, they don't know you're not original. I mean, that. They uh, they think you're as original as anyone, or back then. I mean, I'm sure they, they just thought, this guy knows how to perform, and we love his stuff. Yeah, well, they, they thought it was great. Yeah. You know, they say, sing this song, but he sing it. <laughs> I said, cool. That, I mean, that was when I did it some more then, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. See, you know, guys, I mean, uh, what do you do? You're about, uh, what was that, seven years old or something? I was about to say, if you were knee-high earlier on as early you were on. pulling on Coy's pants to get up there while he was playing, and then uh, mm -hmm. when Anna Inez was carrying you around, you must have been young. I was. I was. Now, did you have some friends who were uh, who were also musically inclined at some level? You all got together to, to form uh, to form a band? Or what, what encouraged you all to get together? How, how did that happen? Uh, this is in high school. Okay, that was well, even later. Well, elementary school, we started in school, and then... Uh, we were in the high school glee club, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Mrs. Sample, our musical teacher, she she suggested we form a, a quartet, a mm -hmm. pop quartet, mm -hmm. and it was like uh, William Massey, Norman Wade, and myself, uh, Douglas Rooker, uh, it was Dr. Douglas Rooker now at Lancaster. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we formed Bob Shop Quartet, we started singing, and then we were also playing in high school band. Mm -hmm. So, 
we took the knowledge we had doing the pop songs and we started playing our own instruments because I was on the keyboards. Uh, William could do the saxophone, Banshee, as we called him back then. Mm -hmm. Douglas played the bass, upright bass. <laughs> and uh, he played the bass and Norman could sing, sing bass. And so we started like that and then it kept improving and then we started playing the high school proms and all that. Right. And we started adding to the group. Some guys fell by the wayside and some came in and we added and we stayed. We were playing high school proms, man. And uh, that's why I never attended a high school prom because it was always planned for the high school mm -hmm. prom. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and it was, it was, it worked out. It was beautiful. Okay. Now, of course, on, on the on the normal side for non-performers who were going to proms on a regular basis, was that tough that your friends could go and you just had to be there to perform, or did you feel? I mean, clearly you felt a part of the prom being being a performer there. Yeah. You were performing at multiple proms, not only your only high, not only your own high school. Right, <laughs> right. No, we didn't. We didn't show anything. We just we enjoyed playing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was just a thing that we enjoyed doing because then all the girls would come up. And that was one of the main factors that, you oh, know, yeah. they would come with us and the guys would get hot, you know. <laughs> I'm sure they did. God and we me. became friends with the guys and, and yeah. the girls, you know. And from there we went on and, and did talent shows and everything. And, oh, yeah. hey, it, it didn't bother us because we were getting into what we, we were doing what we liked to do, what we loved to do. We wasn't getting a dime, but we were doing it, you know. So, hey, it was good. Even now there are kids, I mean, high schoolers are getting together. Mm -hmm. setting up bands and going out and performing at proms and otherwise. I wonder how they differ from what you guys were doing back then. Maybe not at all. Just like you see in Happy Days now and thinking, that was us. Yeah. They enjoy it. They, I, I think they, they just enjoy the the playing ability, the performing, and they're perfecting themselves and don't even realize it. You know? Mm -hmm. as, as they go along. And that's what we did. You know? It, it just started getting better and better, and we started adding it. And then we were right into to the heart of uh, improving ourselves and becoming better guys performing and mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. So it all worked out real good on that. Did you all have a name for the early band? We called ourselves the Royal Charms. The Royal Charms. Royal Charms. What kind of music were you all performing then? We were doing stuff, uh, rhythm and blues. Okay. We were doing stuff like, uh, we were doing some of the fast domino stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing some of the dominoes, mm -hmm. Billy Ward and the dominoes. We had a group then. And we were doing the clovers, five keys, mm -hmm. five royals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all, all those cats back then. We were, we were singing this stuff. Otis Williams and the Charms. Mm -hmm. We're doing his song Hearts of Stone. You, you, you probably don't remember that. I know you don't. I don't remember Hearts it. Hearts made of stone. Do the why do. But never do the why do the. Da 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 I think Patty Page recorded it also later on. Later on. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Otis Williams and the Charms. So we were doing that, this stuff, all the Clover stuff. We are doing that at early age. And in, as teen never thought I would meet these guys. Yeah. By the way. Excuse me. <clears throat> you mean you never thought that later on you'd meet those the actual original performers? Right. right. Never thought I would meet them, Greg. And you obviously did. I did. Yeah. Man, I said, wow. <laughs> it was just, it was fantastic. How, how about, was there anyone, and of course, we're jumping a few years, and I want to get mm -hmm. back to high school and how you, where you all went. But was there anyone later in life or any time in life that you first performed with and were maybe the most nervous or that you yearned to really, I mean, the most exciting potential performance, someone else you were really excited about performing with? Johnny Mathis. Johnny Mathis. Johnny Mathis. Oh, my God. <laughs> first of all, we, we were crazy about this guy. So oh, yeah. Because coming out of the Glee Club, we were trained singers. And we thought he, we knew that he sang the correct way right you know we knew that and we we wanted to to have this thing just like it we're trying to be too perfect i guess you would call it today mm -hmm. but that's the way we were trained then so finally when we got to play apollo he was on the show 
And uh, I keep jumping the gun, but this is... This, no, that's this, fine. Yeah. This happened because he was on the show, and uh, he was uh, he was the head man. He came in from Miami, I'll never forget. And uh, we would open the show. The Zodiacs would open the show. Johnny came in from uh, uh, Miami's special day. Met him, nice guy. He's beautiful. Oh yeah, he's a great guy. Oh yeah, still is. Oh yeah, still is. And he's kept his youth so well. Yes, definitely. We went and uh, he came on. When he came on, he couldn't say anything for about fifteen minutes. For the applause of the kids. Oh wow! This was when he was so hot, man. It was, gosh, Marty K, the MC, then had to come out, quiet the audience down. Jenny performed, fantastic. Oh my God! Yeah. We were back there, and I was shaking all over my boots. Yeah, sure. So we got to follow him. Ain't no way, man. This ain't going to happen today. Yeah, <laughs> we think yeah. all this just trim. I Really? Yeah, sure. I mean, literally I shaking, bet. man. I bet. I, I went to Murray. Murray decayed him. So I said, Murray, we got to do something. So what you going to do? You got to do something for me, man. You got we got to follow him. He said, Murray, be cool. Don't worry about it. Just relax. You're going to be okay. I said, okay. So I went back there. <laughs> He, after Janet's performance, which was fantastic, <clears throat> Murray goes on, speak to the audience. He said, now we're going to change the music completely around. We're going back to rock and roll. Going back to rock and roll oh, wow. again. And we're going to bring us some guys that you've been hearing about. Yeah. Doing all week. We've been there for a whole week. Oh, now. okay. Right. Yeah. He said, we're going to change this format a bit. He talked to him so well. Right. And got him calmed down. When he said, "Now nah, Maurice Williams and Zodiac," oh, they went crazy again. And we were all right once we got oh that there. God, it Maurice. was something, man. <laughs> that you was... had to be. Now, I, and I'm sure Johnny probably stayed around and watched. Uh, he did, which was probably even he more did. exciting, just to know that it was. Uh, it was. And that's what. Then that goes back to what we were talking 20 minutes ago about every person in the audience is like the president. You can perceive that every person in the audience was like Johnny Mathis. That's exactly the fact right. that you he stayed know. around to watch you entertain must have been uh, amazing. It was amazing and such a thrill to, to see the audience. And we went over as usual. And then we got up when we came off stage, he shook my hand and said, it was great. It was just good. He enjoyed it. I said, man, thank you. You know, we come yeah. down, everything was, yeah. we were on a roll. It was yeah. just smooth. And after that day, we never looked back. We just kept going and been grateful, yes. been humble. Mm -hmm. how, do you stay, how do you stay humble when there's thousands? I think it was a few years ago, Harry Turner was telling me in early 2000, maybe you performed in London, uh -huh. in the UK, had 6,000 folks there. They bought everything you had, everything you brought with them, CDs, uh, T-shirts, everything. They were screaming throughout. It was one of those exciting performances he, he tells about. How do you stay humble when uh, you got 6,000 folks in another country who dig you so much that... Uh, well, we do an awful lot of praying, which is good. A lot of praying. We give thanks. We give thanks. And we are humble that way when we go on. We give thanks before we go on and after we come off the whole ball game. This way, we stay humble. You know, because we know that God has gave us this. Mm -hmm. And we give him thanks, and we say prayers, and we treat every man equally. We try we try to do that. And by doing this, we just stay right down on earth, man. You know, that's where I've been. And yeah. speak, speaking of treating every man differently, we go back to high school, and there were some, it was a, there were some tough times, but you, you performed some amazing things at Lancaster High School, which was, a, I, I believe, you all won a big contest there. And there, am I correct? There were some yes. frat guys from USC, and yes, and that was a not necessarily a treat everyone equal type of environment. And no, but uh, once again, we were performing. Right, so they didn't care. <laughs> Absolutely. They didn't care, you know, and uh, we were on there as performers, and we were we won the talent show, right. and guys in the audience from the University of South Carolina was there. They booked us at the frat houses, uh, the frat house down in uh, Columbia, and uh, gosh, 
from there we started getting paid. That paid the bills. Yeah. Paid the bills, and we just went right ahead on that. They were not going. We played there all the time. Every weekend we were playing the University of South Carolina. So I went to college at the University of South Carolina. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's right. But You're down really, there very yeah, definitely. really, it was just wonderful. You know, and we from there, the University of Georgia guys were there from Georgia and Georgia. They were from Texas, and, and we just kept playing. And then we became known all over the co on the college circuit. Right. And and we stayed like that. Which opened so many. You think of Hootie and the Blowfish now. Yes. They played at my fraternity house. All right. They played at my fraternity house in 1990. Mm -hmm. And Darius okay. Rucker and these guys coming up on the hall to talk to brothers, uh, and you think, this guy is giant, I mean, now. I mean, you, yeah, you think about right. that, but just knowing 12, 13 years ago, of course, the same USC connection. Exactly. Having had great strength at the University of South Carolina, and then um, Maurice, there's so many more questions I want to talk about. I hope you don't mind. We'll take a break, and then uh, for viewers, they can come back tomorrow and, and, and be with you. This is very exciting. There's a lot more to Maurice Williams that folks need to hear about. Okay. Stay tuned to more Carolina people coming up next. You can catch more Maurice Williams tomorrow. Thanks, Maurice, for making today's Carolina people so special.